Chapter 13 The Garden of the Lord Out of the scurrying of my feet hither and thither, over the face of North India, two tracks converge upon a unique, little-known colony, which is housed in a town that bears the poetical name of Dayalbagh, the Garden of the Lord. One of the tracks starts in Lucknow, where I have the good offices of Sundarlal Nigam as guide, philosopher and friend during my stay in that picturesque city. We roam the city together and talk philosophy as we roam. He is, I suppose, not more than 21 or 22, but like many of his Indian brothers, he has matured early. We wander through the old Mughal palaces and muse upon the inexorable fate which has overtaken the vanished kings. I fall in love anew with the glorious Indo-Persian architecture, whose graceful curves and delicate colorings reveal the refined taste of its creators. How shall I ever forget those bright days when I idle among the orange trees of the royal pleasure gardens which graze Lucknow? We explore colourful edifices where once the seductive favourites of the old kings of Oud flaunted their olive-skinned beauty upon marble balconies and in golden baths. Now these palaces are empty of royal flesh and hold only memories. I return again and again to a beautiful mosque which stands near the quaintly named Monkey Bridge. Its exterior is white throughout and gleams in the sunlight like a fairy palace. The shapely minarets seem to rise in perpetual prayer to bright heaven. Peeping inside, I see a crowd of worshippers prostrating themselves upon the ground and rhythmically invoking Allah. The scene receives accentuated charm from the brightly coloured little rugs upon which the devout perform their prostrations. None can doubt the fervour of these followers of the Prophet for their religion seems a living force to them. Amid all these excursions and peregrinations, I become gradually impressed by certain characteristics belonging to my young guide. His shrewd remarks, his exceptional intellectuality and his matter-of-fact attitude towards mundane affairs are somehow blent with the depth and mysticism of a student of yoga. It is only after repeated meetings and ardent discussions during which I become aware that he is sounding and probing my own beliefs and ideas that he reveals himself to be a member of a semi-secret fraternity called the Radha Swamis. I pick up the second track which leads me to the Alberg from Malik, another member of the same brotherhood. He comes within my orbit at another place and time. As Indians go, he is a fine, fair-skinned, stalwart fellow. For centuries his people have had as neighbours wild frontier tribes who keep covetous eyes on their neighbours' possessions. But the wise British government is taming these restless fire-eaters, not by recourse to the old methods of endless fighting, but by taking them into its service and pay. Malik is superintending some of the fierce tribesmen, who have submitted to the more pacific and useful occupations of making roads across hill and desert, constructing bridges and building defence forts and barracks. Many of these wild-looking persons carry their rifles, more perhaps from old habit than from present need. They are at work all along this stretch of the north-west frontier, making new routes for traders and new defences for soldiers. Malik works hard and well near Dera Ismail Khan, that frontier outpost of empire. His character harmoniously couples a sturdy self-reliance and intense practicality with nobility of character and profound thought. I am impressed by the careful balance of his qualities. After a strong initial reticence, which is in accord with all the ancient traditions of yoga, he reluctantly yields to my inquiries and admits that he has a master whom he periodically visits whenever his service leaves permit him to do so. His master, whose name is Sahabji Maharaj, is head of the Radha Swamis, 
and I learn for the second time that his master has conceived the astonishing and interesting notion of combining a yoga discipline with a daily life based on Western ways and ideas. The friendly efforts of these two men, Nigam and Malik, bear fruit at last. I am to be the guest of His Holiness, Sahabji Maharaj, who is uncrowned king of the Radha Swami's own town of Dayalbagh. I motor the few dusty roads of road from Agra to the colony. Dayal Bagh, the garden of the Lord. If my early impression is correct, the founder is striving to keep the town true to its beautiful name. I am taken to a building which houses the master's private office. The waiting room is furnished in an attractive European style. From my restful easy chair, I can appreciate the nicely painted walls and the refined simplicity of the furniture. Here is westernization with a vengeance. I have encountered yogis in bare, drab bungalows, in lonely mountain caves and in gloomy, thatched huts on riverbanks. But never have I expected to find one of the tribe housed in such a modern environment. What manner of man is the leader of this unusual fraternity? I wonder. I am not left long in doubt, for the door slowly opens and he himself walks in. His figure is of medium height. His head is wrapped in a spotless white turban. His features are refined, though not typically Indian. With a slightly paler skin, he might have passed for a quiet American. A pair of large spectacles cover his eyes and a short moustache adorns his upper lip. He wears the high-necked, many-buttoned long coat, which is the Indian tailor's adaptation of our Western style. His bearing, as he approaches, is modest and gentle. He welcomes me with courtly dignity. Our greeting over, I wait till he has settled down in his chair and then venture to compliment him on the artistic decorations of the room. A row of brilliant teeth, gleams across his mouth as he smiles his reply. God is not only love, but beauty. As man begins to express the spirit within him, he should express more beauty, not only in self, but in surroundings and environments. His English is noticeably well-spoken. The voice is quick and confident. There is a little period of silence and then he speaks again. But there is another decoration upon a room's walls and furnishings, which is invisible, yet it is very important. Do you know that these things carry the influence of people's thoughts and feelings? Every room, every chair, even gives out the unseen influence of the person who has constantly used it. You may not see this atmosphere, but it is nevertheless there and all who enter within its range are unconsciously affected by it to varying degrees. Do you mean that there are electrical or magnetic radiations around objects which reflect human characters? Quite so. Thoughts are real things on their own plane and they attach themselves for shorter or longer periods to whatever we consistently use. That is an interesting theory. It is more than a theory. It is a fact. Man possesses a subtler body than the physical, and in this subtle body, there exist centers of activity which correspond to the physical organs of sense activity. Through these centers, he can discern invisible forces, for when they are energized, they bestow psychic and spiritual sight. A brief pause follows, and then he asks my impressions of India's condition. I frankly criticize his country's neglect of modern ways of living, its slowness in picking up all those pleasant comforts, handy conveniences, and mechanical inventions which improve man's brief sojourn in this world, its inattention to the demands of sensible hygiene and proper sanitation, and its excessive devotion to stupid social customs and cruel practices which are supposedly based on religious practices. 
I tell him freely that priestly preoccupations seem to have kept India's energies in a cul-de-sac with deplorable results. Our instance, some of the irrational things which I have seen done in the name of religion, but which merely succeed in proving how men can neglect or misuse the gift of intelligence which their God has bestowed upon them. My outspoken observations draw a definite assent from the lips of Sahabji Maharaj. You have hit on the very points which form part of my program of reform, he remarks, gazing at me reminiscently. On the whole, it seems that many Indians expect God to do for them what they are perfectly capable of doing for themselves. Exactly. We Hindus talk glibly of religion in order to cover up a lot of things which have nothing to do with religion. The trouble is that for the first 50 years or so, a religion is pure and vital. Later, it degenerates into a mere philosophy. Its followers become talkers, not religiously living men. Finally, it descends for its last and longest phase into the arms of hypocritical priests. In the end, hypocrisy becomes accepted as religion. I gasp at such straightforward admissions. What is the use of wrangling about heaven and hell, about God and so forth? Humanity finds itself on the physical plane and it ought not to neglect the matters which pertain to this plane. Let us try to make our life here more beautiful and happier, he concludes. That is why I have sought you out. Your disciples seem such fine men, straining to be as practical and up-to-date as any European, making no parade of religion, but living good lives. And withal, they keep to their yoga practices with faithful regularity. Sahabji smiles in acknowledgement. I am glad you have observed that, he replies quickly. By setting up these activities at the Albag, I am attempting to show the world the same thing, that a man can be perfectly spiritual without running away to caves, and that he can reach the highest attainments in yoga while carrying on with worldly avocations. If you can succeed in that effort, the world may think a lot more of Indian teachings than it does now. We are going to succeed, comes the confident reply. Let me tell you a story. When I first came here to begin the colony, one of my chief desires was to have plenty of trees about the place. But outsiders told me that it was impossible to grow trees in this barren, sandy soil. The Jamna is not far off, and this site is one of its old tracks, an ancient riverbed in shot. There were no experts among us and we had to learn by frequent experiment and constant failure which kind of tree could live in such unpromising soil. Almost all the trees planted during the first year, and there were over a thousand of them, died off. However, one tree thrived. We noted it and kept up our endeavors. Now there are 9,000 healthy trees growing in the Albag. I tell you this because it is symbolical of the attitude with which we are facing our problems. We found barren ground here. It seems so worthless that no one else would buy it. Look how it has been transformed. Then it is your aim to build an Arcadia near Agra? He laughs. I tell him of my desire to see the town. Certainly. I shall arrange it for you at once. See the Albag first and then we can talk about its why and wherefore. You will understand my ideas better when you can see them in practice. He rings a business-like bell. A few minutes later, I am walking on tour of inspections along half-finished streets and among bright-looking factory buildings. My guide is Captain Sharma, who was formerly in the Indian Army Medical Service but who is now devoting all of his services to the constructive effort which is being made here by his master. A quick reading of his character 
conveys the impression of another successful combination of Western striving with sincere spirituality. A luxuriant avenue provides the entrance to Dayalbagh, which is a clean little town. All the streets are bordered by shady trees. Some beautiful flower gardens adorn the central place. I am told that they represent repeated efforts to conquer dry desert and which does not take kindly to horticultural activity. A mulberry tree, which was planted by Sahabji Maharaj in 1915, when he began to build his colony, stands as a symbol of his appreciation of an artistic background. The industrial quarter's chief feature is a group of workshops which are called model industries. They are sensibly designed, light, airy, clean and spacious. My first steps take me into the footwear factory. Busy driving belts hum continuously from an overhead spindle and set a long line of machines in operation. The dusky mechanics work with deft hands amid the dim and seem as expert at their task as the operator I've seen in huge English factories at Northampton. The workshop manager tells me that he had learned his technique in Europe whether he had gone to study 20th century methods of leather goods manufacture. Boots, shoes, sandals, handbags and belts pass noisily through all the processes of mechanical manufacture. The men and the machines had begun as raw novices and were taught and trained to their work by the manager. Some of the goods produced find a local outlet in Dayalbagh and in Agra, while the rest goes to more distant cities. Shops are being opened in the latter places, the sales organization being based on the multiple store idea. I pass into the next building, which proves to be a textile factory. The products are mercerized cloths and silks, which are made in a limited range of patterns. In another building, I find an up-to-date engineering machine shop, a smithy and a molding shop where a monster sledgehammer sounds the active inspiration of the place with each of its power-operated thuds. Scientific instruments, laboratory apparatus, balances and weights are being made in a nearby workshop and made well enough to have won the patronage of the United Provinces government. I watch the delicate operations of gold, nickel and brass electroplating. The other departments of model industries are busily producing electric fans, gramophones, knives and furniture. One of the mechanics has invented a special type of sound box and this, too, will be manufactured in the near future. I am surprised to discover a fountain pen workshop and learn that it is the first one to come into existence in India. A long series of experiments has been necessary before the first pen could be marketed. One thing has baffled these industrial pioneers how to put the iridium tip on gold nibs. They hope to discover the secret one day, but meanwhile, the nibs are sent to a European firm to undergo the process of tipping. A complete printing equipment at the Dayalbagh Press looks after the town's print needs, both in the business and literary fields. I inspect samples of its output in three languages, Hindi, Urdu and English. A small weekly newspaper, the Prem Pracharak, is also run off machines and posted to many Radha Swamis living in distant parts of the country. In every building I find workers who are not merely satisfied but positively enthusiastic. A trade union would be an utter anomaly in this place. Everyone does his job, whether it is high or low, as though it were a real pleasure and not a task. The town possesses its own electrical generating installation, which provides the power for all the machinery in factories and for the ventilating ceiling fans in larger houses. In addition, every house is electrically illuminated at communal expense, thus avoiding the necessity of costly meters. The agricultural section contains a small but modern farm, which is still in an early stage of development. A steam tractor and a steam plow are amongst the mechanical equipment. The chief products are fresh vegetables and cow fodder. Perhaps the most efficiently organized section is the dairy farm. 
Nowhere else in India have I seen its like. It constitutes a model dairy fit for exhibition purposes. Every head of cattle is a pig specimen, which provides a significant and favorable contrast to the animals one need not go further than Agra to see. Scrupulous cleanliness is observed in the stalls and I am told that the scientific methods pursued have resulted in a substantially higher yield of milk than that obtained in the average Indian dairy. A pasteurizing and refrigerating plant has enabled those inhabitants of Dayal Bagh and Agra who appreciate good germ-free milk to obtain it for the first time. Another imported appliance is an electrical butter-making machine. All the credit for this section goes to a son of Sahabji Maharaj. That energetic and efficient young man informs me that he travelled to the chief daring centres of England, Holland, Denmark and the United States in order to learn the most up-to-date methods used in his work. The supply of water for the farms, as well as for the rest of the town, proved a difficult problem in the colony's early days. An irrigation canal was dug and a waterworks installation erected, but expanding demand forced Sahibji Maharaj to seek additional sources of supply. He enlisted the help of government engineers who bore the deep tube well with successful results. The colony possesses its own banking institution, a strongly built structure with iron grilled windows bearing the name Radha Swami General and Assurance Bank Limited. The bank has an authorized capital of 20 lakh of rupees and not only transacts private banking business but controls the town's finances. The Radha Swami Educational Institute stands in the center of Dayalbagh. It is fitted placed for it is the finest building in the colony. Its 200 feet of red brickwork look well up to western eye. The windows are shaped into Gothic arches and surrounded by white marble. Flowering gardens front the edifice. This modern high school has several hundred students and is managed by a principal and 32 qualified teachers. The latter are idealists who are young and enthusiastic and filled with a desire to serve both their pupils and their master, Sahabji Maharaj. A high standard of general education is maintained. No formal religious teaching is given, but an effort is made to develop noble character. In addition, Sahabji Maharaj visits boys from time to time and every Sunday delivers a spiritual talk to the assembled school. The boys are encouraged to practice sports. Hockey, football, cricket and tennis are their favourites. A library with 7,000 books and a curious little museum complete the institute. Another magnificent building houses the girls' college, which is conducted on similar lines. It represents a determined effort by Sahabji Maharaj to break down, within his own sphere of influence, the unenviable illiteracy which was forced on Indian women until recently. The Technical College is the youngest of the educational institutions. It provides courses in mechanical, electrical and automobile engineering and trains mechanicians and foremen and manufacturing industries. Special machines and benches have been placed in the model industries section for the use of college students so that classroom instruction goes hand in hand with practical experience under factory conditions. There are several attractive hostels for the hundreds of pupils who attend the three colleges. Each hostel is light, airy and modern. The residential part of the town is under the supervision of the Dayal Bagh Building Department which provides the plants and erects all houses. Each street possesses its own pleasant harmony of architecture and it's evident that artistic unity is one of the ideals of these town planners. Ugly erections and defective shoddy buildings are barred because a prospective tenant is free to choose his style of house only from the department's own plans. Four sizes of residence have been standardized at graded and fixed prices. The buyer pays actual cost plus a very small percentage. The colony maintains a bright little hospital and a maternity home. 
It has fixed its aim at being self-contained in every way so that I am hardly surprised when I learn that the uniformed policeman who brings his hand to a smart salute is also a member of the Radha Swami fraternity. Yet, his presence raises a peak note of inquiry in my mind, for I expect that the level of morality in Dayalbagh is so high as to render crime conspicuous by its absence. He is here to protect the place from undesirable intruders. When Sahabji Maharaj is able to spare me a little time again from the pressure of his heavy duties, I pay my meed of tribute to his praiseworthy achievement and then tell him of my astonishment at finding such a progressive town in unprogressive India. But, I ask, how do you finance it? You have surely spent a great sum in capital outlay. You will probably have seen an opportunity later of seeing the money come in. He returns. The members of the Radha Swami fraternity are themselves financing the colony. There is no compulsion of them to do so, nor are subscriptions required from them. But they regard it as their religious duty to give what they can to help the Alba grow. But although we have had to depend on these contributions during the initial stages, my aim is to make it completely self-supporting. I shall not rest until we approach the stage of complete independence. You have wealthy supporters then? Not at all. The rich Radha Swamis can be counted on the fingers of one hand. Our members are all in modest or moderate circumstances. The progress we have made has called for self-sacrifice on the part of many. Thanks to the grace of the Supreme Father, we have been able to find and spend many lakhs of rupees so far. The colony's future is assured, for its income will grow as our fraternity expands. Therefore, we shall never be out of funds. How many members have you? Our membership is over 1 lakh 10,000. But of course, only a few thousands have settled here. The Radha Swami fraternity is nearly 70 years old, but its greatest growth has been made during the last 20 years. And this progress has occurred, mind you, without any public propaganda because we are a semi-secret organization. If we cared to come out into the public eye and propagate our teachings openly, we could increase our membership tenfold. Our members are spread all over India already, but they look to the Alberg as their headquarters and visit us as often as they can. They are organized into local groups, which meet every Sunday at precisely the same hour when we hold a special meeting at the Alberg, Sahabji pauses to wipe his spectacles. Just consider, when we began building this colony, we possessed no more than 5,000 rupees, which had been presented for the purpose. Our first plot of ground was no larger than four acres. Now, the Alberg covers thousands of acres. Does it not seem that we are indeed growing? How large do you intend to make the Alberg? I expect to settle about ten to 12,000 people here and then we shall stop. A town of 12,000 people, if it is properly laid out, is large enough. I do not want to copy the monstrous towns of your western countries. They are overcrowded and therefore breed many undesirable qualities. I want to build a garden city where people can work and live happily, where they can have plenty of space and air. It will take a few years more to finish the Alberg's growth and then it will be a model community. Incidentally, when I first read Plato's Republic, I was pleasantly surprised to find in that book many of the ideas I am trying to express here. When the Alberg is complete, I want it to act as a prototype for the creation of similar communities all over India, or at least one in each province. I shall offer it as my solution of many problems. You want India to turn her energies into industrial development? Most certainly. That is her crying need. But I would not like to see India lose herself completely in it, as you in the West have done. He laughs back. 
Yes, India must build up an industrial civilization to rid herself of the poverty which grinds the masses. But she must build it up on a system which will avoid the fight between capital and labor that would otherwise accompany it. How do you propose to do that? By aiming at personal well-being through general well-being and not at the expense of the community. We work on a cooperative principle and everyone sets the success of the Alborg as being higher than personal success. There are pioneers working here for salaries much lower than those they could obtain elsewhere. I refer to trained and educated men, not to illiterate laborers, of course, who do this voluntarily and gladly. This principle works well here only because we are inspired by a spiritual purpose which is also the motive power behind all other efforts. Some men who are in a position to do so are even giving their services freely. This will show you what a fine spirit and enthusiasm our people have. But when the Alborg is fully developed and completely self-supporting, I hope such sacrifices will be unnecessary. Anyway, it is the ideal of making spiritual progress more quickly which has brought these people here, for that is the fundamental aim of our fraternity. If you were to come here and join our colony, you might be worth a thousand rupees a month, but you might have to take only one third that amount because we cannot afford to pay high salaries. Then gradually, you might build a house, acquire a wife and beget children. But if in this process, you begin to think only of the material side of your career and to lose sight of the spiritual ideal for which you really joined us. Then to that extent, you begin to fail. Despite all these material activities you see here, we try never to lose sight of the central purpose for which our fraternity was founded. I see. Now we are not socialists in your Western sense. But it is a fact that the industries, the farms and the colleges are owned by the community. Moreover, this ownership extends to land and houses. You may build a house here, but it is yours only whilst your tenant is. Beyond these limits, everyone is perfectly free to possess and accumulate whatever money and property he has and wherever he has it. This, of course, completely divides us from the tyrannies of socialism. All our communal properties and all the money offerings voluntarily made by members are regarded as trusts to be administered in a religious spirit. Everything is subordinated to our spiritual ideal. This administration is supervised by a body of 45 members, representative of the various provinces in India, which meets twice a year to scrutinize accounts and consider budgets. The ordinary work and general control is in the hands of an executive committee of 11 members. You said before that you would offer the Alborg as a solution of many problems. I do not see how you can offer it as a solution of the economic problem, which is perhaps the cheap one today. Sahabji Maharaj smiles confidently. Even India may have something useful to contribute on that point, he rejoins. Let me tell you about a plan which we have lately put into operation in order to quicken our rate of growth during the next few years. This plan, to my mind, embodies economic and social principles of radical importance. We have established an inheritance fund which invites offerings from those of our members who are able to subscribe 1,000 rupees and upwards. Every such subscriber then receives an annuity of not less than 5% from our administrative committee. At his death, the same annuity will be paid to his wife, child or whoever else he has previously named. The second person has the same right to name his or her successor to the annuity. But with the death of the third generation, all payment ceases. Should the original subscriber find himself in difficult circumstances or urgent need, then part or even all of his sum may be repaid him. Thus, lakhs of rupees will, in course of time, pour into the coffers of our committee through the inheritance fund. Yet, the purses of our members will not be laid under heavy toll. Whatever contribution they make, will, they will be sure of a moderate income in return. 
I take it that you are trying to find a clear place between the evils of capitalism and the fancies of socialism. Anyway, I'm sure you will deserve every bit of your success and I hope it comes quickly. It becomes clear to me that Dayal Bagh possesses assured resources for a successful future in the ever-growing inheritance fund, in the constant stream of voluntary donations and in those industries which have reached a profit-making stage. Several well-known leaders in India are watching our experiment and waiting to see its result, says the white-turbaned head of the Radha Swamis. Some have visited the Albag and even critics who oppose our ideas have come here. You see, the Indian people are among the weakest and poorest in the world, and its leaders offer conflicting panaceas. Gandhi came here once and engaged me in a long conversation. He wanted me to join his political campaign, but I refused. We have nothing to do with politics here. We believe in concentrating on the practical means of regeneration. Although I do not concern myself with Gandhi's political plans, I scout his economic ideas as being visionary and unpractical. He wants India to throw all machinery into the sea. Sahabji shakes his head. India cannot go back to the past. She must go forward and develop the best points of a material civilization if she is to become more prosperous. My countrymen had better take a lesson from America and Japan. The land spinner and the hand weaver can no longer stand the onslaught of modern rationalized methods. And as Sahabji Maharaj expounds his ideas, I catch the picture of an alert American mind encased in a brown Hindu body. So efficient and businesslike is his manner. So precise is the expression of his thoughts. My rational temperament is attracted by his air of common sense, balance and sanity. Quality is not very common in this subcontinent. I realize anew the curious paradox which his character presents. Master of over 1,000 people who practice a mysterious form of yoga, Prime Minister of the multifarious and materialistic activities which seethe around me in the Albag, taken all in all, I write him down as a brilliant and breathtaking man. Nowhere in India, nowhere in the entire world, may I expect to meet his like again. His wife breaks into my thoughts. You have seen two aspects of a life here in the Albag. But our activities are threefold. Man's own nature is threefold, spirit, mind and body. Therefore, we have the workshops and farms for physical work, the colleges for mental growth and lastly, there are the group meetings for spiritual activities. Thus we aim at harmonious and all-round growth for each individual but we place the greatest emphasis on the spiritual side and every member of our fraternity endeavors to carry out his individual yoga practices regularly, wherever he may be. May I join one of your group meetings? With pleasure, we shall welcome you at every gathering. Dayal Bagh's activities begin at 6 o'clock in the morning with the first group meeting. Dawn swiftly rubs away the darkness of night Sweet chirrups mingle with the funereal cries of crows, and all the birds begin their matutinal homage to the sun. I follow my guide to a gigantic canvas structure which is supported by wooden posts. A huge crowd of people presses around the entrance, where each person removes his sandals or shoes and hands them to waiting attendants. I follow the requirements of custom, and then enter the great tented hall. A raised platform stands in the centre and His Holiness Sahabji Maharaj sits there in a chair. Hundreds of his followers squat in circling ranks around him so that the entire floor is carpeted with human bodies. All eyes are turned upon the Master. All tongues are still in silent reverence. I make my way to a place beneath the platform and then squeeze myself into a narrow space. Soon, Two men stand up at the rear of the hall and their voices break out into a slow chant. The words are Hindi and the rhythm is extremely agreeable to one's ears. This continues for some 15 minutes, by which time 
the strange, sacred words have lulled one into a peaceful mood. And then, the voices diminish in volume until they die down altogether. I look around. Every person in the vast tent is quiet, motionless, sunk in meditation or prayer. I look at the modest, plainly dressed figure on the platform, from whose lips no single word has yet come. His face is graver than usual. His alert, active manner has disappeared, and a serene contemplation seems to engage his mind. What thoughts cross and crisscross under this white turban? I wonder. What responsibility lies upon his shoulders, for all these people regard him as a sacred link with a higher life? The utter silence lasts for another half hour. Not a cough, not even a stir. Have all these contemplative Orientals withdrawn their minds into a world barred to the skeptical Westerner? Who knows? But it is a striking prelude to the forceful activities which will soon make the town hum. We recover our footgear and quietly disperse homewards. During the morning hours, I enter into conversation with many Radha Swamis, both residents and visiting members. Several of them speak good English. There are turbaned men from the northwest, pigtailed Tamils from the south, active little Bengalis from the east, and bearded figures from the central provinces. I am impressed by the air of self-respect and by the shrewd practicality which counterpoises their spiritual aspirations. If their desires soar into the Empyrean, their feet still walk firmly on solid earth. Hare, I reflect, is a type of citizen of whom any town might be proud. I like them instinctively and admire them immensely, for they possess that rare quality, character. A smaller meeting takes place during the afternoon. It is a brief informal affair attended for the benefit of visiting members. Individual problems are discussed, questions answered, and some matters of general concern are dealt with. Sahabji Maharaj reveals an uncommon resourcefulness in the way he disposes of everything which comes up. He adopts a chatty, witty tone, is never at a loss for an answer to the subtlest query, and delivers quick, confident opinions upon the most varied spiritual and material problems. His entire attitude betokens an unusual and successful reconciliation of complete self-confidence with quiet humility. He shows that he possesses an engaging sense of humor, which crops up again and again in merry remarks. The evening brings another group meeting. Every workshop, store and farm in the colony has closed its activities for the day and a vast gathering once more fills the giant tent. Sahabji Maharaj occupies his platform chair again. I watch a file of his followers approach his seat and voluntarily place contributions for the funds of the board of management at his feet. Two committee members collect and record all these contributions. The chief event which follows is a lengthy address by the master. His thousands of followers listen to the well-spoken Hindi with absorbed attention, for he has a good oratorial style. He seems to speak from the heart in a picturesque manner which is pregnant with deep feeling. He is so animated by a fiery vigor and ardent enthusiasm that the inspiring effect upon his heroes becomes almost palpable. Each day the same unvarying program is followed. The evening meeting is the longest, for it lasts nearly two hours. It says much for the power of Sahabji Maharaj's mentality that he can keep up this program without difficulty and with his usual dynamic power. No one knows beforehand what the subject of his evening address will be. I question him upon the point and he replies, When I sit down in the chair... I am quite unaware of the subject. Even after I have begun, I do not know what my next sentence will be or even how I will finish. I trust myself unreservedly to the Supreme Father. He tells me instantly whatever I need to know. I take my orders from him internally. 
I am actually in his hands. The words of his first address haunt me for some days. Its theme of surrendering to a master piques my mind until I broach it eventually to Sahabji. We sit on a carpeted piece of ground in the center of the Albag. It is something like a village green and develop a friendly discussion. He reiterates his point and adds, The master is absolutely necessary. There is no such thing as self-reliance in the spiritual sphere. But did you find one necessary? I ask boldly. Without doubt. I spent 14 years searching for a true master before I found him. 14 years? A fifth of your life? Was it worthwhile? The time spent in search of a true master is never wasted, even if it is 20 years, he replies, quick as a flash. Before I became a believer, I was as skeptical as you are. And then I grew desperate in trying to discover a teacher who could open the way to spiritual illumination. I was young and simply crazy to find the truth. I asked the trees, the grass, and the sky to enlighten me if truth existed. I sobbed my heart out like a child with head bent low, begging for light. Finally, I could stand the strain no longer. One day I resolved to give up eating and starve to death unless and until the divine power saw fit to grant me some illumination. I could no longer work even. The next night I had a vivid dream wherein a master appeared to me and revealed himself as such. I asked for his address. His answer was, Allahabad. You will know my full address later. The next day, I spoke to a friend who belonged to that town and told him of my dream. He went away and returned with a group photograph and asked me if I could identify the master's face in the group. I at once pointed to it. My friend then explained that he belonged to a semi-secret society in Allahabad and that the figure I indicated was the master. I quickly got into touch with him and became a disciple. How interesting! Even if you take up yoga exercises alone and depend on your own powers, the day your true prayer is heard will be the day when you will be led to meet a master. There is no escape. You must have a guide. A sincere, fully determined seeker will eventually be brought to his real master. How is one to recognize him? I murmur questioningly. Sahibji faces, face relaxes and an amused expression flickers across his eyes for a moment. The master knows beforehand who is to come to him and he will draw them magnetically to him. His power meets their destiny and the result is inescapable. A little company of variegated figures has gathered around us and is rapidly increasing. Soon, Sahabji Maharaj will not have will have not one hero but two or three school. I have been trying to form a clear understanding of your Radha Swami doctrines, I tell him, but they are hard nuts. One of your disciples has loaned me some writings on the subject by an earlier master of your fraternity, His Holiness Brahma Shankar Mishra with the result that my brain is working over time. Sahabji laughs. If you want to understand the truths of Radha Swami teachings, you must perform our yoga practices. We regard the daily performance of these practices as being far more important than theoretical understanding of our doctrines. I am sorry that I cannot explain the detailed methods of meditation we employ because they are only imparted under a vow of secrecy to those who apply to join us and I accept it. But the basis of them is sound yoga or listening for the internal sound as we usually call it. The writings I am studying say that sound is the force which called the universe into being. From a material standpoint you understand it correctly. But rather it is that a current of sound was the first activity of the Supreme Being at the beginning of creation. The universe is not the result of blind forces. Now this divine force is known to our fraternity and can be phonetically transcribed. It is our belief that sounds bear the impress of their source, of the power which created them. 
Therefore, when one of our members listens internally and expectantly for the divine sound, which control with controlled body, mind and will, he will become lifted up towards the supreme bliss and wisdom of the supreme being as soon as he hears the divine sound. Is it not possible to imagine that the sound of the blood beating through the one's arteries is the divine sound? What other sound can one hear internally? Ah, we do not mean any material sound, but a spiritual one. The force which appears as sound on our material plane is only a reflection of that subtler force whose workings evolve the universe. Just as your scientists have reduced matter to electricity, so we may trace the force which we hear on material plane as sound to a higher vibration that escapes our physical ears because it exists on the spiritual plane. A sound carries the influence of the region whence it emanates and so, if you concentrate your attention inwardly in a certain way, you may one day hear the mystic words which sounded forth at the first upheaval in the primeval chaos and which form the true name of the Creator. The echoes of those words reverberate back into man's spiritual nature. To catch those echoes by means of our secret yoga practice and to trace them up its to the origin is literally to be carried up to paradise. The man who faithfully carries out our Radha Swami practices which are intended to enable him to hear the mystic sound will forget himself in utter ecstasy when at last it impinges itself upon his inner air. Your teachings are startlingly novel to the West, but not to India. Kabir taught the sound yoga in Banaras as far back as the 15th century. One hardly knows what to say about them. Why the difficulty? You will readily admit that one form of sound, music, can throw a man into emotional ecstasy. Then how much more will the heavenly internal music affect him? Agreed. If one could possess, prove that the internal music really does exist. Sahabji shrugs his shoulders. I might present you with several arguments to convince your reason but I fancy you're looking for something more than that. How can I prove the existence of superphysical states by mere reasoning? It is natural for the unprepared brain to perceive nothing beyond this physical world. If you want the best proof, first-hand experience of these spiritual truths, then you must persistently follow up a course of yoga practices. I assure you that the human body is really capable of higher functions than those we commonly know that the innermost parts of our brain centers are associated with subtle words of being, that, after proper training, these centers can be energized until we become aware of those subtler words, and that the most important center of all enables us to obtain divine consciousness of the highest order. Are you referring to the brain centers known to anatomists? Partly. They are merely the physical organs through which the subtler centers work. The real activity takes place in the latter. The most important of these centers is the pineal gland, which, as you know, is situated in the region between the eyebrows. It is the seat of the spirit entity in man. Shoot a man to the spot, and death is certain and instantaneous. The spirit current, which flows through the auditory, optic, olfactory and other nerves converge in that gland. Our medical men are still puzzled about the chief functions of the pineal gland, I comment. And well they might be, considering that it is the focus of the individual spirit entity which gives life and vitality to man's mind and body. It is when this spirit entity recedes from the pineal gland that the conditions of dream, deep sleep or trance supervene and when it finally leaves the gland, the body falls dead. Since the human body is an epitome of the entire universe, in as much as all the elements employed in the evolution of creation are represented in it on a miniature scale, and since it contains links with all the subtler spheres, it is quite possible for the spirit entity in us to reach the highest spiritual world. When it leaves the pineal gland and passes upwards, 
its passage through the gray matter of the brain brings it into contact with the region of universal mind and its passage through the white matter exalts its consciousness to lofty spiritual realities but to obtain the spiritual consciousness all the activities of the bodily senses have to be brought to a standstill otherwise it's not possible to shut off external stimuli therefore the essence of our yoga practices is a complete concentration which turns the current of attention inwards away from one's environment until a profound degree of internal contemplation is attained i look away trying to digest this softly spoken flow of subtle recondite ideas a good decided gathering around us is taking a keen interest in the talk the tranquil assurance which underlies their master's words attracts me but you say that the only way to verify these statements is to practice your sound yoga exercises but you keep those exercises secret i complain whoever applies for admission to our fraternity and is accepted will have our methods of spiritual practice communicated verbally to him can you not give me some personal experience first some convincing proof at first hand what you say may be perfectly true indeed my heart wants to believe it you must first join us i am sorry that i cannot do i am built in such a way that it is difficult to give belief before proof sahab ji spreads out his hands in a helpless gesture what can i do then i am in the hands of the supreme father day after day i attend all the group meetings as regularly as the members of the society themselves i meditate silently in their midst and listen to their masters addresses i question them freely and study such portions of the radha swami teachings concerning the universe and man as are made available to me late one afternoon i wander with the disciple about 1 mile or so away from the albag to where the jungle begins then we turn our feet towards the jamna and eventually sit down on the banks of that wide river from the steep and sandy height we watch the slow moving water wind its placid way through the plain which stretches to agra now and then a great vulture flaps its way over our heads towards its home the jamna somewhere along these banks krishna moved victoriously among the milkmaids charming them with his wondrous loot and his love making today he is probably one of the most worshiped gods in the hindu pantheon up to recent years murmurs my companion this place was the abode of wild animals and at night they roamed over the very site on which the albark has been built and now they avoid the place we sit silently for a couple of minutes and then he says you are the first european to sit in our group meetings though you will certainly not be the last we appreciate the understanding and sympathy you have shown why don't you join our society because i have no faith in faith because i realize that it is fatally easy to believe in what you want to believe he draws up his knees and rests his chin upon them the contact that you are having with our master will benefit you in this case i shall not press you to join we do not attempt to make converts and our members are not allowed to preach how did you learn of the existence of the society very simply my father has been a member for many years he does not live at dayalbag but visits it from time to time he brought me with him on some of those visits but never on any occasion did he attempt to induce me to join about 2 years ago i began to puzzle over things and went about questioning various friends as to their beliefs i questioned my father too and what he told me drew me to the radha swami teachings I was accepted as a member of the fraternity and time has confirmed my faith. I was fortunate perhaps because others have come to us only after a lifetime spent in perplexity. If I could settle my doubts as easily and quickly as yours settled, I respond vacantly. Once again we both revert to silence. 
The dark blue Jamna water draws my gaze and I slip insensibly into profound reverie. All the conscious and unconscious thinking of these Indians is colored by faith, by the necessity of owning allegiance to some sort of a religion, creed or sacred script. Every kind of faith from the most degraded to the most dignified is represented in India. Once I stumbled across a little temple on the Ganges. Its pillars were covered with carved relics depicting men and women engaged in sexual embrace and its walls were frescoed with erotic scenes which might horrify a western clergyman. There is room for this kind of thing in Indian religion and it may well be that the religious recognition of sex is a better thing than its relegation to the gutter. But then, there is also room for faiths embodying the loftiest and purest conceptions possible to man. Such is India. But nowhere in this land have I come across such an amazing cult as the Radha Swamis. It is undeniably unique. What brain other than the Sahib Ji Maharaj's could have conceived this paradoxical combination of yoga and the oldest learning in the world? with the high-pressure mechanized civilization of an up-to-date European or American city. Is the Albaq likely to loom forth in Indian history out of all proportion to its present apparent unimportance? If India is a crossword puzzle to which no one seems to have yet found the correct solution, that is not to say that the coming year shall not provide an answer. Sahibji had laughed at Gandhi's preaching of medievalism, and the town of Ahmedabad, where Gandhi's own headquarters lie, still echoes back this laughter. From the Sabarmati River, one can count half a hundred tall factory chimneys, which smoke defines at the little cluster of white wooden bungalows where the gospel of peasant handicrafts finds its inspiration. The forceful impact of Western ways has begun to disintegrate India's traditional methods of carrying on the necessary business of living. The first Europeans who appeared off the sea coast of India brought not only bales of goods but also ideas. When Vasco da Gama landed his rough-bearded sailors in the quiet harbour of Calicut, there began that process of westernization, which is today at such a quick rate. The industrialization of India has begun in a tentative and timid fashion, but it has begun. Europe has faced in turn the renaissance of intellect, the religious reformation and the industrial revolution, and she has left these things behind. India has awakened and finds them lying in her stride. These are now her problems. Will she blindly imitate the Europeans, or will she work out her own and perhaps better way of solving them? Will Sahib Ji Maharaj's unique contribution focus her attention one day? If I am certain of anything, I am certain of this. India will be thrown into a melting pot of unparalleled character before long. Thousands of years of a society tied up in worn-out traditions, imprisoned in hide-bound religious conventions, will vanish within two or three decades at most. It will seem a miracle, but it will happen. Sahibji Maharaj has evidently grasped the situation clearly enough. He realizes that we live in a new epoch. The old order of things is being destroyed everywhere and in India, as in other countries. Are Asiatic lethargy and Western practicality to remain twin incompatibilities? He thinks not. Why should not the yogi put on a worldling's clothing? And so he gives forth the fear that the yogi must come out of his habitual seclusion and mingle with the noisy assemblages where men command machines. He thinks it is time for the yogi to descend into the factory, the office and the school and attempt to spiritualize them, not by preaching and propaganda, but by inspired action. The way of hustling everyday activity can and must be made the way of heaven, a spiritually based way of living like yoga, which stands too aloof from workday men, may come to be regarded by them as deceptive form of self-important stupidity. If yoga is to remain the hobby of a few hermits, the modern world will have no use for it and the last traces of the dying signs will disappear from existence. 
if it is to serve only as the delectation of some lean anchorites, we who push pens or plows, move amid the grease and grime of engine rooms, who have to endure the hubbub of stock exchanges and the busy barter of shops, we shall roughly turn our heads away. And the attitude of the modern West will shortly be the attitude of modern India. Sahibji Maharaj has shrewdly foreseen the inevitable trend of things and has made a striking effort to save the ancient science of yoga for modern use. This inspiring and strenuous man will certainly leave his mark upon his native land. He has realized that his country has lain in lethargy long enough. He sees clearly why the West, throbbing with manufacture and trade and its agriculture modernized, lives a wealthier life. He sees also that the culture of yoga remains one of the most invaluable inheritances which India has received from her ancient sages, but that the last few masters who keep this culture alive in lonely places are a fading remnant of their class. When they die, the real secrets of yoga will die with them. And so, he has come down from the rare field air of those peaks of thought to our own times to the energetic strivings of the 20th century and is endeavouring to relate the two. Is his effort too fantastic? On the contrary, it is highly admirable. We live in days when Muhammad's tomb in Arabia is illumined by electric light, when the camel is being pushed off the desert sands of Morocco by luxuriously fitted motor cars. What then of India? This vast country startled from the sleep of many hundred years by the impact of a completely opposite culture, must go on opening its heavy-lidded eyes. The English have done more than turn sandy deserts into fertile fields, than build canals and dams to assist agriculture and regulate the floods of great rivers, than fling an impenetrable barrier of highly efficient soldiers across the north-west frontier to keep peace and property secure then bring in a healthy breeze of sane, rational ideas. Out of the grey north and distant west came the white man. Fate placed India at their feet, and the country became theirs, but with few efforts. Why? Perhaps the world, incubating over Asiatic wisdom and Western science, will one day hatch out a civilization that will shame antiquity, deride modernity, and amaze posterity. The trail of my meditation comes to an end. I raise my head and address a questioning word to my companion. I do not think he hears me. He continues to stare across the river, which reflects the last red light of sunset. It is the twilight hour. I watch the great orb make its rapid disappearance from the sky. The stillness is indescribable. All nature, dumb by the lovely sight, seems to have come to momentary rest. My heart drinks in the superb peace. Once more I glance at the other man. His figure is now wrapped in the shroud of fast-gathering dusk. So we sit in the dead silence for a few more minutes until the sun slips suddenly into black night. My companion rises and quietly leads me through the shadows back to the Alvag. Our walk terminates under a canopy of thousands of starry points of light. Sahabji Maharaj decides to leave the Alvag and go down to a place in the central provinces for a well-earned rest. I take the event as our distinct time of farewell and plan a move in the same direction. We shall travel together as far as Thimarni and then our ways will diverge. About one hour after midnight, we descend on Agra station. A score of close disciples accompany their master and so the size of our party is quite noticeable. Someone procures a chair for Sahabji and while he sits in the midst of his devoted followers, I pace the half-lit platform. During the day, I have reviewed my stay at Dayalbagh and realized with regret that no memorable inner experience has occurred. No soul-upheaving vision of life's secret meaning has been vouchsafed to me. I had hoped that some illuminating yogic expansion of consciousness might pierce my mental gloom for an hour or two, so that I would then follow up the track of yoga with sight and not with faith. 
but no, the benediction is not for me. Perhaps I am not worthy of it. Maybe I demand far too much. I do not know. From time to time I glance at the seated figure. Sahabji Maharaj possesses a magnetic personality which fascinates me. He is a curious mixture of American alertness and practicality, British predilection for correct conduct and Indian devoutness and contemplativeness. He is a type which is rare in the modern world. Over 100,000 men and women have entrusted the guidance of their inner lives to this man, yet he sits there in quiet modesty and humility this unassuming master of the Radha Swamis. At last, our train roars into the station and a giant headlight throws an uncanny illumination upon the scene through which the rails pass. Sahabji enters his reserved compartment and the rest of us sort ourselves into our carriages. I stretch myself out for a few hours' sleep and know nothing more until I awake in the morning with an incredibly dry throat. At every halt which the train makes during the next few hours, followers of Sahabji who live in the vicinity of even many miles away crowd around his compartment window. They have been notified of his journey in advance and eagerly seize the opportunity of obtaining this brief contact. For it is said in India that even a minute's contact with a master will produce important spiritual and material results. I seek and obtain Sahabji's permission to spend my last three hours with him in his own compartment. We fall into a long talk about world conditions, about the nations of the West, about India's future and about the future of his own cult. At the end, he tells me in his pleasant, suave manner. Let me assure you that I have no consciousness of India being my own country. I am cosmopolitan in outlook and look on all men as my brothers. Such amazing frankness delights me. It is so with all his conversations. He always goes straight to the point. He shoots every sentence at a definite target and he has the full courage of his convictions. To converse with him, to commune with his mind is a welcome experience. Always he comes out with some unexpected phrase, some new viewpoint on things. The train now moves across country at an angle which brings an intolerable sun through the window and into my eyes. The torrid heat bakes one's flesh. The merciless rays vary one's mind. I pull up the wooden sun blind, that peculiar structure which is so curiously like a Venetian blind, and switch on the electric fan, thus gaining a slight relief from the midday heat. Sahabji notices my discomfort and draws some oranges out of a travelling bag. He puts them on the small table and asks me to share them with him. They will cool your throat, he observes. As this knife slowly parts the coloured peel, he remarks musingly. You're right in being so careful about taking anyone as your master. Skepticism is a useful attitude before you decide on him. But afterwards you must have full faith. Don't rest until you find your spiritual perceptor. He is absolutely essential. Before long, there's a grinding sound and someone noisily shouts, Timarni. Sahibji Maharaj rises to depart. Something awakens in me before his disciples can come and capture him. It breaks my reserve, ignores my Western pride, crushes my anti-religious temperament and speaks through my lips. Your Holiness... May I have your blessing? He turns with a friendly smile, beams pleasantly through his glasses and cordially pats my shoulder. You have that already, he assures me in farewell. I return to my compartment and the train moves rapidly away. Dun-coloured fields flash by the window. Little groups of drowsy-eyed cattle munch contentedly on the sparse herbage. My eyes register them only half-consciously, for my mind is carrying away a picture of a notable man whom I greatly like and profoundly admire. For he is at once an inspired dreamer, a serenely-minded yogi, a practical man of the world, and a polished gentleman. End. Chapter 13